Thanks, Christina. And welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining in. Um, <clears throat> so I've titled uh, my talk today a little bit differently than what it was on the uh, on the site when I did the abstract. You know, after a while, we 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 uh, we got around to thinking. Well, what, the the response to the report seems to be very much so that it's the skills aspect, and having having that being good for your career and something that that uh, hiring managers are looking for. Um, and so I decided to tweak the uh, the title a little bit. So I've, I've called it building open source skills is good for your career. And this is the way. If you're a fan of the Mandalorian, you'll understand that. Uh, there we go. So again, I'm Chris Ferris. I'm an IBM fellow and CTO for Open Technology. Um, basically, I have overall responsibility for all of the open source and, and open standards work that we do at IBM. Um, and uh, I, uh, I have a, a team that's you know very much engaged in open source, and uh, I myself am, am frequently engaged in this project or that. Um, most recently, I was uh, deeply involved in creating the <clears throat> pardon me the Hyperledger organization, and uh, uh, served as a maintainer, board member, chair of the TSC, and so forth. And uh, and this past year work very closely with uh, some colleagues at Microsoft and GitHub and Google. Um, and uh, we created the Open Source Security Foundation, Open SSF. And so that's where I've been spending most of my time lately. Um, and so without further ado, this is not working. Um, so, so let's start with you know uh, somebody that I worked with way back in the day when I worked at Sun Microsystems I work with this guy here, Bill Joy. Um, you may know him. Uh, he's uh, the, sort of the inventor of BSD. And um, he had a saying that no matter who you are, most of the smartest people work for somebody else. We call this Joy's Law. And what he's really trying to say here is that, um, you know, even you know, a company the size of a Google or an Amazon or a Microsoft or an IBM doesn't have all the smart people. There are more smart people that work for the other companies than work for your own. And so when you think about how this impacts innovation, it really means that if, you're, if your uh, competitors are collaborating together out in the open, uh, then you're, you're at a distinct disadvantage if you're not playing in that same party. And then Eric Raymond back in 1997 had a very prescient uh, quote from, from his paper, The Cathedral on the Bazaar, Perhaps in the end, the open source culture will triumph simply because the closed source world cannot win an evolutionary arms race with open source communities that can put orders of magnitude more skilled time into a problem. And this is essentially, this is, this is the, the reason I think in, in many regards as to why open source is succeeding um, and, and is really starting to, to sort of eat away at the proprietary software um, era. So why do, you know, why do people choose open source? Well, you know, there's a perception that there's a better, there's more of a speed of innovation going on in the various open source communities. Um, again, when you're collaborating with even your fiercest competitors in building something like the container orchestration service in, in, in Kubernetes, um, you're gonna be innovating much more quickly than if any one of those companies were to try to do it all on their own. Um, there's a potential cost savings for development. So if you're incorporating open source into the applications or solutions that you're building, you're not having to spend time developing that component that you incorporate that is based on open source. Um, you're, you're getting that from the community. Um, and if you're doing it right, then you're also helping to contribute back uh, either development, documentation, bug fixes, and testing, and so forth. Um, <clears throat> you know, so, you know, there's a, you know, uh, I think, you know, from my perspective, I always think about this in the, in the, in the, in the, in the sense that, um, you know, if it's already been invented, I'm not really interested in doing it again, right? Uh, I'm, I'm more interested in solving problems that haven't been solved. Um, and then enterprise companies that look for interoperability and, and essentially you can look at open source as sort of the next wave of how we do sort of uh, open standards, right? And you think about the whole purpose of developing open standards is to deliver interoperability um, and freedom from vendor lock-in, right? So, you know, back in the day, I worked with 
Microsoft on developing some of the XML web services standards. And the whole point there was to drive interoperability between the IBM world and the Microsoft world. And our customers were really, you know, 100% behind that. Um, uh, but now we're seeing, you know, everything's moving to the cloud and, and yet there is no, you know, there, there's much more of a sense that people are selecting multiple different clouds for their deployments. And so as a result, you're looking for interoperability and portability between uh, different cloud platforms. Um, <clears throat> so what are the benefits to developers? Well, and this is, again, this is taken from some, some charts that I've presented in the past. Um, but basically, open source gives you improved skills. Um, it gives you support. And you can sort of increase your, your technical eminence in those communities um, through participation in, in open source. Uh, so again, it's an accelerant innovation. You're not having to reinvent the wheel, so to speak. Um, it gives you access to experienced technologists. So, you know, one of the things that's really great about open source is that you can be rubbing elbows and working side by side and getting, you know, constructive feedback in code reviews from some of the most uh, experienced technologists on the planet. Um, and they don't have to be working for the same company as you. You could be working for some small startup and yet rubbing elbows and getting advice and and coaching and mentoring and, and critical reviews from somebody who's working uh, and has been working at uh, a company like a Google or, or a Microsoft or an IBM. <clears throat> and, and we're finding that again, open source communities are starting to become these sort of interactive hubs for developers. It's where they can sort of get together and show off their skills, their, their subject matter knowledge and so forth. Um, uh, whether it's in these various conferences that are held as a result of, you know, organizing around these communities, um, or whether it's just in the community development process itself, um, it helps you build that technical eminence um, uh, amongst your peers. And this is important to, you know, your future uh, job prospects. Why does open source matter at IBM? Well, <clears throat> you know, from our perspective, again, it's improved products and offerings. It's improved performance of our ability to deliver capability quickly. Um, and, it's, and it's a source for skilled uh, resources from skilled developers and, and advocates and so forth. Um, you know, again, being able to deliver trusted, scalable, secure services is really important. And again, if you start as a found, with a foundation of open source, such as we have with Kubernetes, for instance, in our OpenShift offerings in our IBM Cloud, um, it gives us a, a head start, and then we can focus on not reinventing the same set of wheels that does container orchestration, but focusing on the user experience, for instance, and making that a little bit simpler for people. Um, it gives us the ability to deliver innovative and highly scalable performance technologies. Again, we talked about Kube, um, but it's the same thing for um, uh, AI and machine learning capabilities. Many of those that are incorporated into, for instance, IBM's Cloud Pack for Data are based on open source technologies um, or are just the open source technologies themselves in many cases. And again, it helps our developers maintain and, and sort of grow in their skill set by con you know, contributing out into these open source communities. So, so we see this as a unique opportunity for IBM. <clears throat> So this was, you know, so like I said, this, I've been saying this now for, I can't remember how long, but, you know, for quite some time when I talk to clients and when I talk to, you know, at conferences and so forth. Um, but last year, um, I think, you know, probably in the early fall time period, um, I came across a piece of clickbait that was basically saying, oh my God, you know, if you're a developer, you need to know these 10 APIs. And it was Amazon this, Amazon that, Amazon the other thing. And I was really annoyed at that because as a developer, that's not the thing that's necessarily, from my perspective, that's not necessarily the thing that I need to know if I'm going to get a job because not everybody uses Amazon. And yes, it's a very popular cloud platform, but not everybody uses Amazon. And certainly not everybody uses Amazon exclusively. And so what's really motivating developers, I thought, was no, I think it's really the underlying open source that fuels a lot of these cloud platforms that really matters and not necessarily the vendor specific APIs uh, that adorn them. And so I got together with uh, some colleagues in IBM's Market Development Insights 
And, um, you know, we pitched the idea, we should do a study to find out exactly what is it that's motivating developers, right? Do developers really think that they should know a proprietary API over the underlying open source APIs? Um, what's important from, from their perspective of, you know, from a career building perspective, um, what motivates hiring managers into hiring somebody? Is it their knowledge of the underlying uh, uh, proprietary APIs or is it the knowledge of the underlying open source that's really important to, um, to hiring managers? And so we, um, <clears throat> we work with O'Reilly to develop um, a survey that went out and we, we talked to, um, it's uh, 3,441 3, um, respondents. There was actually a few more than that, uh, but not all of the responses were complete. So we only took all of the complete ones, but um, uh, basically just over 3,400 uh, respondents, uh, sort of a variety that I'll show you in a second, you know, sort of the, the mix of, of who, who we were talking to. Um, and, uh, you know, we asked them a series of questions relating to the, the, the topic I just, I just uh, broached. Um, what do we find? So the majority think that knowledge of and or contribu contributions to open source um, are much more important to their careers than, um, and their professional opportunities than are, you know, focusing exclusively on proprietary APIs. So that's that's sort of the most important thing I think that you know we we learned from from this study. Um, you know, obviously, I think there's a lot of the 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 same things that we just talked about. You know, people are looking to open source software because it gives you certain guarantees uh, or certain mitigations against uh, vendor lock in. Um, there's lower cost involved because you can actually download your the, the software for free. Again, it doesn't. It's free as in, as in, as in beer, there, there is obviously some support costs and so forth associated with it, op operational costs. Um, but it's also the ability to sort of build on and leverage the ideas and innovation from a large community, right? Um, and so that's really, I think, the, the attractiveness of, of you know, why, why developers feel that it's important. Um, two thirds of the developers considered the skills related to the underlying open source as being more important than the proprietary platforms themselves. Um, and so Linux and Kubernetes are much more beneficial uh, than the proprietary uh, APIs that the cloud providers offer. Um, and then, you know, in terms of which of the technologies from an open source perspective are uh, most significant, most important to developers and to the hiring managers in terms of experience, looking, you know, looking for experience in their, in, in their potential hirees, Linux, itself was number one. Containers obviously came in a close second. Databases were perceived as more important and then it sort of trickled down to you know various other specific technologies. Um, but you know again when we think about you know developing from a cloud native perspective and from a data and AI machine learning perspective, you know these are the things that really are the underlying uh, powerhouses for for that that type of development. Um, and, and basically about 50% of the developers consider that their knowledge and their experience with these technologies had resulted in higher pay. Um, and so that's, that's really sort of the, the gist of it. You know, as I mentioned, um, we wanted to understand the value of open source to developers um, when, we, when we went out there. So that was the, the primary motivation behind the study. Um, I mentioned we have a total of 3,441 participants in the study itself. Um, about 50% identified themselves as software engineers or architects um, and, you know, DevOps and so forth. And then, you know, the others were hiring managers and so forth. We have a breadth of coverage from large enterprises, from mid-market companies and smaller ISVs um, and, and smaller companies. Um, and again, the, the responses were pretty much consistent across all the different um, uh, dimensions here. I, I, I will, though, highlight a couple of important distinctions in terms of the responses when you sort of drill down into the, to the details of the study itself, where we find that some hiring managers are actually more bullish on open source than the developers themselves. So again, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a strong signal for um, you know, where things are, are heading. Um, so again, you know, we talked about this, you know, what what are the benefits of, of open source over proprietary software? And, and this is pretty stark. 
you know, the, the, the differenti differentiation here, you know, minimizing vendor lock and, you know, basically 85% um, of the, the respondents felt that it was um, uh, either, uh, I'm losing my, uh, oh, here we go, somewhat, so, you know, whether it's strongly associated uh, or somewhat associated um, versus disassociated. So, you know, again, you know, these are, that, that's a significant uh, uh, data point there. And then, you know, people basically felt that, well, obviously if you're dealing with vendor specific stuff, you're not necessarily minimizing your vendor lock-in. Um, there's a lower cost perception. I think, again, this is one of those, this is one of those areas where, you know, obviously it's, it's open source, it's free, you can download it, it doesn't cost you a nickel. Um, and you can just deploy it in your enterprise, but then there's always the day two operational aspects of things. How are you going to patch it? How are you going to support it going forward? Um, that's, that doesn't come for free. Um, so there is a certain support cost associated with it, but certainly I think many still perceive that even adding in the sort of the, the day two operational support and, uh, and, and support and development uh, cases that um, uh, it's still lower cost than, than, than proprietary software offerings. Um, again, there's another catch to that. I think increasingly people do sort of hit that threshold where they realize what they really want is they want the open source for the benefits, the other benefits that we see here, um, but they're, they're looking for somebody to help them with the support um, and services of the, uh, the, the technology itself. 76% um, think it makes me feel like I'm part of a community. And I think that's, uh, even if you're just a user of the software and not contributing back and participating actively out in the open source community, um, it, there's a certain affi affiliation with that broader community if you're, if you're in the user community and sometimes you end up going to, well, maybe not now with uh, the COVID, but you know, in the past, you know, people would show up at conferences that aren't necessarily contributing in the community, but they're using the technology and they, they want to learn more. They, they want to sort of rub elbows with the people that are building it. Um, so there is a, a strong sense of community associated with open source. There isn't really with proprietary software. Um, it provides incentive to innovate. Again, you know, this is one of those things that I think, you know, people underestimate is that, you know, because open source, you know, it gives you the ability to fork it. You can, you can, you can actually take something and then you can build a derivative of that. You can build on the shoulders of giants, as I say, um, and come up with something new and important and, and improved in, in some, in some way. Um, it makes my job more meaningful. So 66%, almost two thirds say uh, that it, it makes them, uh, feel more meaningful in, in terms of their job. Um, prevents silos, again, a slightly lesser percentage um, thinks that it pre prevents silos. Again, the, the, the proprietary software in the red there um, is still trickling down in the single digits. Um, more support available. This is, again, this is the point that I was making above um, in that, you know, again, um, th there is, there's an increasing awareness of the fact that you can actually get fairly decent support from the community, whether it's the documentation, whether it's, uh, you know, seeking, you know, filing an issue and getting a response and getting a bug fix and so forth. Um, many of the uh, more vibrant and diverse and, and uh, sort of popular communities are very effective at delivering essential uh, support. Um, you know, not necessarily the same that you would expect from a vendor, um, and certainly the vendor software, about 35% there think that it's um, more strongly associated with, uh, you know, with, with vendor specific technologies. Uh, but again, increasingly, I think people are looking to um, uh, vendors providing support for the open source, right? In the Red Hat sort of model of providing a subscription to an underlying source software package. Um, more reliable, more error, uh, you know, less error prone and so forth, I think. Uh, again, increasingly, people are looking at open source as providing that, you know, with the, um, you know, the old saying um, of uh, many eyes makes all bugs shallow. It's not totally true. It's, you know, there, there are always bugs in software. That's the nature of the game. Um, but increasingly, you know, especially as communities focus on things like improving security and improving their, their testing and so forth. Um, you know, generally, um, people are finding that open source tends to be much more 
reliable, robust uh, than uh, even the proprietary offerings. And then easier to use. And I think, again, this, this comes from the perspective that uh, because you can engage with the community, it's easier to get feedback into um, the development cycle. And so ease of use comes out uh, oftentimes in, in, in dealing with that. Okay, um, other key requirements, technology flexibility. Right, um, and again, this is where you know you think about from an open source perspective. You actually have access to the software, you know, and so you can maybe configure it to suit your specific needs. Uh, you can augment it. You can build on top of it, right? So it's much more flexible than proprietary software that you don't have the software, you know, you don't have the code for, um, and you're you've got to sort of adapt to whatever APIs they give you. Um, de developer satisfaction, again, most developers prefer to work with open source than with proprietary software. Uh, again, speed of development, the quality of the code, we talked about that. Security is another important thing. Um, although, again, it's not something that's perfect, um, you know, but it is something that increasingly more and more people are starting to think very um, long and hard about securing the open source uh, supply chains, uh, if you will. Uh, especially in light of things like uh, the Sarah Winds incident. Um, functionality, again, people think that, you know, from a perspective of providing the functionality that they need, they get better response from open source software, um, better performance and stability from open source. And then again, we have the support, which works in the other direction. Um, you know, when you buy something from a vendor, you know, they're signing up to give you full blown support and services around that capability, that technology. Um, and so they're on the hook, uh, but I think that trend is moving in the right direction where more and more, you know, people are looking for support for the open source and not for proprietary um, um, derivative of that. Um, open source skills are more beneficial to people's careers than skills related to specific cloud platforms. This was, again, this is the, 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 the sort of the, the crux of what it was that I was hoping to hear. Um, and, and, it, and it sort of paid out you know, in spades here. 65% um, think that open source is much more beneficial to their careers than dealing and, and acquiring skills related to specific platforms, um, which was 35%. Um, and so this, again, this makes me feel good <laughs> because, uh, I get to say, I told you so, right? Um, but it's, uh, it, it's actually, it's interesting from the perspective that if you're a developer and you, you, you have to sort of make some choices in your life about, you know, so what am I gonna pursue? Which skills am I going to acquire to make my uh, job prospects better and so forth? Um, this gives you a pretty clear picture of where you should be focusing. Um, Again, two thirds of developers would prefer to work with an open source based cloud platform. Um, you know, so, so that's, that's significant, right? That's significant. Um, you know, you might get better performance out of somebody's, you know, platform uh, that's, you know, based on closed source. But the reality of it is actually that uh, increasingly more and more of the cloud platforms that are available are based on the underlying open source of something like Kubernetes, certainly most of them are delivering Linux-based um, uh, uh, operating system. Um, having experience with open source provides greater long-term value for my career. Again, you know, uh, I have to do something here. Seventy uh, percent. <laughs> uh, you know, it's, uh, sixty-seven percent uh, think that it's important for uh, long-term career prospects. Um, 69%, this is, this is an interesting one because again, this is something that I've certainly believed for quite some time. And it's really great to see the feedback coming from developers and from hiring managers um, that actually contributions to open source result in better professional opportunities. And I think that this is, uh, this is another important trend because we're seeing more recently that um, it's not just the vendors that are contributing into these open source communities. It's actually the users that are bringing some of the best feedback. Um, and you know, whether they're working for a large uh, financial institution or whether they're working in healthcare or um, a supply chain, what have you, um, they're starting to become more and more engaged directly in the upstream open source projects that they're basing their, um, their solutions on. Um, 
uh, contributions to open source provide more visibility and speaking opportunities in my area of expertise. Again, 67%. Um, this is important. Um, using open source helps attract talent. Now, again, this is something that I think, you know, I, I've certainly believed for some time, um, you know, and uh, I, I'm not a hiring manager. <laughs> Um, and, uh, but I do know uh, very many of them, and I do know that many of them do look when, when they're looking to hire somebody, they check to see, are you involved in an open source community? You know, what's your commit history look like? Um, you know, and, and they may even ask around um, in those communities, you know, what do you think about so-and-so? So it is uh, increasingly important. Um, and, and this is actually one of those one of those points that I think um, actually turns out that um, the hiring managers actually felt uh, more uh, strongly about this than the developers themselves. So again, it's another sort of data point that you know I think is important to take away from this is that hiring managers, are, <laughs> they're on board. And so as developers, you need to think about, so what are the hiring managers interested in? So there's some really interesting data points in this report about that. Um, so contributions to open source impress potential employers um, and often result in better job opportunities. Again, 65%, uh, you know, very, uh, very important there. Uh, what else we have? Using open source increases respect and credibility of my peers, yes. Um, open source experience and skills are usually an important factor to determine who to hire. And again, this is another one of those data points that, you know, uh, hiring managers felt more strongly by about 5% um, generally across the board than the developers themselves. Um, again, another, another interesting sort of uh, point here. Um, so again, you know, just sort of repeating this and this, this breaks it down then into, so what technologies are people, you know, our developers, you know, focused on from a career perspective. So Linux, you know, 80%, right? Um, and, you know, again, 68% felt that it's really, really important to have profici proficiency and, in, and be a subject matter expert around Linux. Um, and then 57% felt that it helped them get higher pay by becoming an expert in Linux. Uh, databases came in at number two um, with 70%. Um, containers close behind with 68%. Um, and again, you know, this is a newer set of technologies, and so we're still growing our proficiency and set of sub subject matter experts around this. Um, but again, very similar levels of, you know, yeah, this has definitely helped me uh, and, and get higher pay and so forth. Container orchestration around Kubernetes here, um, again, 52%. Um, again, slightly newer, um, but again, it's becoming more and more uh, important. And then AI came in, uh, in in fifth place here. Um, technologies like Istio and Knative and so forth were, um, you know, lesser to lesser degree. Again, they're much newer, uh, not quite as uh, well known um, generally, um, and uh, um, uh, but still, uh, you know, when I look back in the report and dig into the details, um, you know, the these levels here down to Kubernetes are still greater than the developers who responded, yeah, I need to know, you know, AWS or I need to know Azure and so forth, um, which were uh, less than 50%. 87% um, of hiring managers considered applicants' knowledge of open source in their hiring decisions. That's amazing when you think about it. Um, uh, and then, you know, the, the 2020 open source jobs report um, actually had sort of very similar data in it that reinforced saying that 93% um, of hiring managers said that they're finding it difficult to find the talent with the open source skills that they're looking for, which is up 5% from 2018. Um, and that hiring managers report that knowledge of open source is the most significant impact with 70% more likely to hire a pro with open source skills um, up from 66% in 2018. So again, this is this is clearly sort of uh, you know reinforcing and ratifying the same findings. Okay. Um, and again, hiring managers considering OSS important from uh, in, in terms of hiring decisions. 
Um, again, um, sort of the same sort of set of numbers, but again, in both cases, you know, whether it's attracting talent or whether it's, um, you know, the skills that they're looking for when they're hiring, um, hiring managers by about 5% in both cases uh, felt more strongly than the developers themselves. So uh, developers take note. <clears throat> Um, what it, so what's open source good at or excelling at? Um, again, 88% felt that it um, was uh, leveraging ideas and innovation from a larger community. So again, you know, uh, it, it sort of reinforces that notion that open source is the fuel for much of the innovation that goes on these days. Minimizing vendor lock-in, we talked about that. Uh, enabling choice of deployment platforms. Again, as I mentioned, um, and it's actually also reinforced in another report that just came out yesterday, and I didn't have time to put the link in and so forth, but um, the, the Red Hat uh, Enterprise Open Source Study, their third year in a row now, came out, and it's basically reinforcing that about two-thirds of respondents are saying that they're using multiple clouds. So being able to sort of have the ability to do either Portability or certainly portability of skills across a number of different cloud platforms um, is critically important to many enterprises. Um, it's compatible with my enterprise IT environment. Um, again, what we're finding is, and this, and this is another one of those areas where the hiring managers actually felt more strongly. Um, you know, when, when we looked at um, in the report, you know, who's using open source in your enterprise, hiring managers actually had a stronger um, opinion about uh, how much they were using it, um, and it was, uh, you know, significantly more than the the general population of the study. Um, uh, and so, it's important to their um, to their hiring decisions because that's basically what's in their enterprise. Shortening time to value again, seventy two percent, and then uh, time to problem resolution and the support thing. It, it's something that's being worked. Um, and again, I think increasingly you're finding that some vendors are providing support um, or subscription support for open source itself without sort of any kind of proprietary wrapper. Um, so, um, you know, sort of coming to a conclusion here. So enterprise, uh, you know, or I should say technology consumers are, do more than just consume open source if they're gonna be effective participants in this, in this community. IBM has got a long and uh, I think very positive history um, in open source. I like to say that we've been doing open source since before it was cool. Um, if, you're, if you're as old as me, <laughs> you, you know, I can say that, but basically we were doing open source even before Red Hat uh, came into existence. We had IBM engineers and research and in um, in some of the systems divisions that were working on Linux um, in the very, very early days of Linux. We were working, working uh, on developing the Apache HTTP server, uh, you know, back in the day as well. And, and we helped to found the Apache Software Foundation, the Linux Foundation, the Eclipse Foundation, um, you know, and then you sort of fast forward OpenStack. So I was there with, you know, the AT&Ts and, and um, Intels and others that, you know, sort of went all in on OpenStack, um, you know, um, uh, what was it now? It's about eight, nine years ago. It seems like yesterday. Um, uh, creating the OpenStack Foundation, I worked with the Pivotal folk to help to stand up the Cloud Foundry Foundation. Um, you know, we were involved in creating the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. Uh, I helped to set up Hyperledger, um, uh, you know, OpenJS Foundation. GraphQL, Algeria, you know, various of these communities, IBM has been a significant contributor to, and in many cases, we actually contributed significant amounts of um, both resource as well as uh, intellectual property to get these uh, organizations up off the ground. Pardon me. So, we, you know, it's, it's really important to sort of complete that virtuous cycle of contribution and not just consumption. And in fact, one of the points in the report actually does highlight the fact that um, uh, that it's important that you're seen as contributing to open source as a vendor, um, because it, it's it, the, the sense there is that if you're delivering capability based on that open source, it's much better if you're actually contributing. And so our, our 
our strategy, this is our strategy in a nutshell, is that we have this hybrid cloud platform of Red Hat, OpenShift, and Enterprise Linux um, as a foundation for um, a number of uh, capabilities that we deliver through the IBM Cloud Packs and various other um, SaaS uh, software offerings on the IBM Cloud and or on the, uh, in, in software delivery. And you know, with services built on top of all of that, um, that it's it's all really when you when you sort of drill down into the heart of all of this, it's really all about open source, um, and and that's accelerating even further, which makes me very happy. Um, and again, we feel that this actually creates a better value for for clients, right? When it's open, you know, um, it it you're harnessing the innovation in the open source communities. Um, and uh, we, we differentiate on top of that, but again, the underlying APIs or something like OpenShift um, are Kubernetes and you can use the raw Kubernetes APIs right out of the box. Um, so, you know, again, this is, you know, sort of fulfilling uh, the, the dream that I had when we, uh, when we went to, to market, um, you know, that sort of reinforces my sense of where the world was, uh, makes me, me feel good. And hopefully it makes you feel good and, and, uh, and hopefully it makes you think about, you know, the value of open source to your own careers and to uh, your own uh, teams as you're thinking about hiring. Um, so, you know, reiterating, what did we learn? Again, majority think that knowledge of and contributions to open source give you much better long-term job prospects um, and professional opportunities to grow within your companies. Um, uh, it benefits, um, the, the benefits, I should say, of open source, uh, you know, I think are well, you know, reinforced with the, the findings in the study. Two thirds of developers think that skills related to underlying open source is much more important than the um, proprietary counterparts. Uh, containers, databases, and uh, AI are perceived as the most important technologies to, to know. And then <clears throat> Um, again, about 50% 50, 50 just over 50% thought that knowledge of these technologies has resulted in higher pay. Uh, and so with that, I think I'll turn to questions. I think we have about 10 minutes left. Great, yeah, we have uh, one here. It says, I noticed that the skills of open source and around open source tools are more and more needed in telecommunications. What do you think about building competencies around open telecommunication architects like Open RAN? Um, I, I think that again, whatever it, you know, whatever domain it is, I think that the open um, uh, sort of side of that, if if you will, um, is probably the one where, if I were you know beginning my career, that's where I would focus. Um, I think you know again the 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 choice of you know which industry um, you know which which uh, vertical you want to focus in is probably yours but um, uh, yeah I mean I think I think definitely um, focusing in on communities that are focused on delivering open source um, uh, capabilities to a given uh, technology domain are are going to be more successful uh, than focusing on proprietary solutions and you know again you're seeing Again, uh, in many cases, you're seeing in the telecommunications industry, for instance, you're seeing the AT&Ts and the Verizon and so forth, they're engaged in these open source communities um, around networking and so forth. So absolutely. Okay, great. Um, this next one is a little bit long, so bear with me. <laughs> um, okay. It says, since 2018, at least five multi-billion dollar companies, Redis Labs, Cockroach Labs, Confluent, publicly traded MongoDB, and recently Elastic have changed their software licenses to block Amazon from reselling their software to AWS's massive customer base, yeah. representing a combined market capitalization of about $42 billion with the inclusion of Elastic. These companies appear to be driving momentum in favor of business models built around more restrictive licensing and sending a signal to emerging open source startups seeking to compete with Amazon's cloud division. Do you see a battle over open source business models and movement towards more restrictive licensing? So, you know, this is one of those, <laughs> this is a really good question. 
um, and it's very topical. Um, I think, you know, many would say that open source isn't a business model. And I think that's correct. Um, but what is a business model is what do you do with um, the software and delivering a service, um, you know, whether it's a SaaS offering or delivering a software offering and this, you know, the services and support around it are real. That's where the real value is, not so much the code. And again, the value of open source is in the community um, that builds up around it. Um, uh, you know, I, I'm not going to, you know, pick on any particular vendors um, in, in this particular case, but I will just say that um, it, there, there are some who are um, takers, if you will, uh, you know, some who are basically just exploiting the fact that here's this free thing and I'm just going to go use it and contribute very little uh, in, in the way of um, the virtuous cycle of uh, contribution back. And I think that's sad. Uh, it's a reality. Um, but again, um, it's, it's, it's not something to be solved necessarily by changing um, one's license um, to make it essentially not open source. Because um, <clears throat> then you're essentially cutting off the, uh, the contributions and so forth. Because developers are looking for the ability to contribute back, the ability to know that uh, they're contributing to something that they could use, that they could fork, that they could, um, uh, you know, uh, they can do so without, you know, sort of falling afoul of, of the license. Um, and so, you know, I'll just say again, you know, and I, I highlighted the fact that IBM has been, a, I think, a very good partner from an open source perspective because we have been contributing back. Uh, for so long, and certainly, you know, from a Red Hat perspective, that's their that is their business model. You know, everything that Red Hat does is based on upstream software, upstream open source software, um, and yet they're doing pretty well from a business perspective. Now, are they exclusively the developers for something? You know, no, they they try to build communities. That's the whole point: is building a diverse community. Um, and, and making it so that, you know, becoming part of that community is an important, uh, is, is important to its exploitation. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's sad when we see, you know, those examples that you gave. Um, uh, and uh, I, don't, I don't like it any more than any of them do, right? But the reality of it is, I don't think it's the license that matters. I think, again, it's the community. Um, and, you know, anytime you try and retain control, that's when you tend to lose it. Okay, great. We have about five minutes left, but we have a whole mm -hmm. bunch of questions here to get through. So I will try to get through them all. Um, David says, apologies if I missed something, but how many companies extend software asset management and license management to OSS? If they don't, does this cause problems? And how many companies are confident about what OSS they have, where it is, and what depends on it, like OSS config management? This is a really, really good point. I didn't, it, I didn't bring it up. It, it's not really a focus of the study, but you know, establishing a practice within your organization for effectively managing, monitoring, and providing sort of policy-based governance around the open source that you both consume as well as contribute to, I think is fundamentally important. And it's one of the things that I talk to with clients about all the time, right? They, they're asking, how does IBM deal with open source? Um, and, you know, some of them are coming at it from, you know, sort of the license aspect of things, right? How do we not run afoul of, you know, doing the wrong thing from a licensing perspective, but it's also, I think fundamentally important to understand, so what technology, what open source technology have you consumed in developing your application, your solutioning, you know, in, in, your, in your data center and so forth, um, so that you can understand, so that when there is a vulnerability that's reported, how can I get it patched? And should I be, you know, establishing a sort of a practice for ensuring that, you know, if there's a, uh, you know, a zero day uh, vulnerability published, you know, that I'm acting quickly to remediate that in my, in my enterprise by having a clear understanding about where is something being used. And so there are, there are vendors out there that provide tooling um, that allows you to sort of, um, you know, scan the software. 
build up a database of use and so forth um, within your within your enterprise. Um, and I would highly in, encourage you know every company to sort of establish a uh, what we call an open source program office that essentially manages um, you know developing the policy and 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 enforcing the policy to a certain extent. Um, you know, without it becoming onerous, you know, without it becoming an impediment to getting anything done, um, but having a clear appreciation for what you have in your enterprise is very important. Okay, great. And this is a more um, sort of general question. Um, how do mm -hmm. we start contributing to open source as a person early in their career? How do we find the right projects to start contributing to? Should we look for an easy project to start with, or do we select a project, learn its design and source code, and then start contributing? You know, this is a great question. And, um, <clears throat> you know, my answer to this would be pick something that interests you. Oftentimes, the best, uh, if you will, um, the, the, the interest comes from, you know, it's something that you're using, right? There, there's a saying, you know, you're, you're scratching an itch, right? Um, and, and that's where a lot of innovation comes from. Um, and so if you're using some technology or some tool um, and you like that tool, but you think it could be a little bit better, right? That might be a good place to start. Um, you don't have to start with you know, necessarily writing code. Um, there are ways to engage in communities that um, are not always code-based. So if you're a little bit sort of trepidatious and, and you, you know, you're, you're afraid of, um, uh, you know, that, that, you know, somebody will laugh at your code, they won't trust me. Um, uh, there are jerks out there, obviously, but, you know, for the most part, people are very respectful in these communities. Um, but you can start with, you know, maybe helping out from a documentation perspective. Again, if you're a user, then maybe you know better than others about how it should be used and how you should document it, or maybe you understand where the documentation is lacking and you can help fill in some of the blanks there. Um, uh, another place that you can help out is just in triaging things, right? Um, you know, going through an issues list and making sure that the issue is both well described, but also provides with um, an ability to test that the defect is in fact um, uh, found. Um, and so you can just help by triaging and saying, yes, this is, um, you know, fully documented. It provides the, the testing necessary to sort of prove that the, the defect is there. Um, and you don't have to fix it, but you can help by doing that bit of triage and it helps the maintainers of the community um, uh, to be more efficient in responding to issues and so forth. Um, so, um, you know, again, there's, uh, there's no right or wrong answer here, right? It, you know, there are some communities that are so large, it can be a little bit overwhelming. Uh, then there are some that are so small that they can be, you know, kind of crickets, right, if you will, uh, and not necessarily very responsive either. You know, finding, you know, the sort of doing the Goldilocks thing of finding the one that's sort of just right. Again, a lot of that is really gonna be based on your own personal preferences, the things that interest you, um, and things maybe that you're using are maybe where, you know, there's the best place to start. Great. Uh, next question we have is from Jay. He asks, in your personal vision, do you think we'll move to a more transparent open source like world in the tech space? If so, why and what will that world look like? You know, uh, so this is this is a great question, <laughs> and you know it's it's actually something that I'm you know uh, I'm passionate about and I'm working on you know within IBM. Uh, IBM has been involved in open source, like I said, since before it was cool, uh, you know, back in the early 1990s, and um, uh, and obviously we think that it's so cool now that we spent 34 billion dollars on a company, Red Hat, um, and uh, that that's based exclusively on open source. Um, I have a saying, you know, open source all the things. Um, and, you know, some people laugh at me sometimes, you know, because they think I'm just kidding. I'm not. Um, I, again, I, I tend to think that, um, you know, the value of something isn't in the software itself. It's not in the code. It's in the support and services you're able to build around it and the, the, the things that you can do with it that are much more valuable than the software itself. 
Um, and, and <clears throat> you know, being able to sort of have, you know, and, and I'll take as an example, you know, sort of Kubernetes as, as an example, there are like 4,000 people a year that contribute to Kubernetes or some of the sort of adjacent projects. That's insane. There is no company on the planet that has 4,000 engineers working on something. Um, <clears throat> and so there's innovation coming from all walks of life, uh, you know, from every, you know, just about everywhere on the planet, um, uh, all bringing their, you know, either their, their experience in using it uh, in trying to help improve it uh, over time. Um, and, and so they're able to do things that I don't think even Google could have imagined um, uh, doing on their own. Um, and uh, I think more and more people are starting to sort of get it, that that's actually where we're going to innovate. And so, yeah, I, I tend to think that, um, you know, generally the trend is to more and more open source and less and less closed source. And that even the proprietary offerings are starting to become a little bit less proprietary, you know, uh, secret sauce sprinkled in and, and more. Uh, let's just deliver the open source effectively and, and uh, consistently and provide the best support and services we can for it. Okay, great. Next question we have. Um, without open source technologies like OpenStack, Kubernetes, Docker, and Ansible properly integrated to make fog commuting possible, was this possible using proprietary software? How do you see the future of fog and cloud working together? So, um, <clears throat> so again, I think you know, when, when I think about something like this, it's really, it's sort of the same message as the hybrid cloud message that, you know, IBM and Red Hat have been uh, harping on. Um, there's, there's no one cloud, there is cloud, right? Which is really this fog of, different cloud providers and on-premises um, uh, deployments. And ideally you shouldn't be worrying necessarily about where it is, um, uh, but we can integrate these things together. I think that without open source, we couldn't be pulling this off. Again, um, you know, when I think back in my career to the early 2000s when we were doing web services with Microsoft, um, it, it would take us, you know, about a year and a half to deliver a standard to, you know, a specification that we could both ratify, you know, not just IBM and, and, and Microsoft, but, you know, the community generally would ratify and, and agree on and then took another, you know, nine to 18 months to deliver um, uh, capability based on that open standard, right? Um, and so innovation was slowed. Um, and what happened was the rest of the world just sort of said, well, we can't wait for this, we're moving on, right? And they went down a different path um, that was based on uh, a lot of open source capabilities and rest and so forth. Um, and, and so at the end of the day, you know, you have to look at that and say, okay, so did what Microsoft and IBM do and, and you know, not just us, but, you know, the other vendors out there at the time, um, did, what was their mistake? Well, their mistake was being slow. <laughs> <laughs> and, and not sort of seeing the fact that, you know, opening things up has actually enabled much more rapid innovation um, and uh, makes it easier to do those types of integrations. Um, so, you know, again, I, I definitely think that um, uh, increasingly we're starting to see just about every dimension of technology is being sort of uh, uh, is consumed by open source. All right, we have about four minutes left. Um, so we could probably have time for maybe two more questions. I'm gonna take this last one that I see about IBM professes to be open source. Uh, why haven't we opened up risk and power offerings? Okay. Um, we actually did. <laughs> open power is a thing. It's been a thing for a while. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, the, the power uh, hardware and the power APIs and so forth are all open source. 
Um, and we've been contributing to it and, and it's being, uh, it, it's, it's actually, it's, it's quite pop popular um, in, certainly in China, it's popular. We have Google and various other vendors um, participating and contributing to the development of open power. Um, and so, yeah, we have. Now, again, um, I'm, I keep working to try and open up more and more and more. And I, you know, we're seeing that happen. Uh, if you take a look out on the IBM organization on GitHub, I think we are approaching 2,000 um, repositories under there. Um, uh, two years ago, it was less than a thousand. Uh, it was more like you know a hundred. And four years ago, it was it was crickets. So you know, increasingly, more and more capabilities that IBM uh, once held as proprietary are going out as open source. And increasingly, even the things that are fundamental to our future success, things like quantum computing, we've open sourced. We open sourced the Qiskit. Um, SDK for the quantum computer, and we've also open sourced the uh, the assembly language specification uh, Cosm, um, and uh, and there is probably going to be more, um, but it, and it's not just that. It's you know uh, AI and machine learning models around fairness and um, and robustness um, uh, have been open sourced and contributed into the Linux Foundation. So. Uh, there's an awful lot that we open source. Now, is everything open source? No. Um, but again, increasingly more and more is. And the pressure from the most senior management, you know, again, if anybody gets open source, it's Arvind Krishna, <laughs> who basically was the, uh, you know, the, the powerhouse behind the, the Red Hat acquisition. And so, um, you know, I think uh, at, the end, at the end of the day, you know, we, we become more open with each passing day. Right, and time for maybe one more question. I'm not going to comment on rumors. Is there open source threatened by it for enterprise? I don't. I don't see open source as necessarily threatening enterprises unless they don't jump on the bandwagon. <laughs> uh, I don't see it as a threat necessarily. Do you see any other here that you might be able to answer in our just last moments? Um, uh, can I comment on the alignment between the IBM and Red Hat open source offices? We have a good relationship. We don't, you know, um, it, you know, IBM and Red Hat have this sort of wall between them. We're trying to sort of remain somewhat independent of one another for a variety of, of business reasons. Uh, but we do have a very solid relationship with Red Hat in our upstream communities um, where we both uh, participate. And we do coordinate on uh, some things like, uh, you know, who, who's going to, you know, take the lead in organization X. Increasingly, many of the open source foundations we participate in together um, are, uh, you know, putting in bylaws that say that only one of an affiliated set of companies can uh, be represented on a board. So obviously we have to do some coordination around something like that. Um, but for the most part, um, you know, again, the, we, we, we try to, uh, uh, you know, remain engaged to, you know, to do, you know, to various alignment type things, but we aren't like, you know, hand in glove kind of, you know, marching to a single drummer. Um, we each are going our, our, uh, on our own paths. Great. Thank you so much. All right. Well, it was my pleasure. Uh, I hope everybody got something out of this. And uh, again, feel free to hit me up on Twitter or LinkedIn. Uh, although I'm more responsive to Twitter than I am on LinkedIn. Um, and uh, please do download and read the report. I think you'll find it very valuable. Great. Well, thank you so much to Chris for his time today. And thank you to all the participants who joined us. As a reminder, this recording will be on the Linux Foundation YouTube page later today. And we hope you're able to join us for future webinars. Have a wonderful day. All right. Thank you.